Right, so Labour Party healthcare civil war, he says. What's the crack here then, Damo? And the crack is that things are not at all peaceful, apparently, in Keir Starmer's health team. Because where Sir Kid Starver Starmer and his chief health minion, the sparrow faced careerist with a caring side as cold as a well digger's arsehole, was streeting, are only too happy to extol the virtues and welcome the continuing frigid embrace of private health care into our NHS, whilst taking donations, of course, from the aforementioned private health care lobbyists. Things are not as sweet amongst junior shadow health ministers, those operating under streeting in his department, who are, as a proportion, five to six against more private health care provision. I have nagging doubts about how legitimate this actually might be, though, which I'll come on to. First, the story. There's apparently a top to bottom split over NHS policy in Labour right now between those like Starmer and Streeting who want more private health care provision and those who want to get rid of private health provision. And this is interesting insofar as we haven't really seen much dissent against the party leadership and the eternally more Tory direction they're always seeming to be going in. But it seems there might be some. And short of a thumping, irrefutable majority at the next general election, enough Labour MPs were to become emboldened to give Starmer a headache, and not before time. He certainly deserves it, it could cause him problems. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. We haven't seen much of that so far. But West Armour and Streeting are besotted with the idea of using spare capacity, as they put it, in the private sector to get patients seen faster. A total falsehood. Private health care doesn't have the capacity to pick up NHS shortfall. Plus it costs us all more, as care isn't what drives them. Dividends and profits for their shareholders is. And any money being invested in the private sector, a significant chunk of will just go to lining wealthy people's pockets. Privatisation fails, which is why MPs who can be bought and paid for aren't worth a single vote from any of us. And as far as private healthcare goes, you only need look at the Every Doctor UK website to see which MPs have accepted money from private health. I covered this website in a video a while back, but of course that has been continually updated too. But, as luck would have it though, they're currently building a new version of it right now, and they've taken the original bloody thing down. So I can't update from my previous vid on the takings of certain MPs, uh, as every Doctor UK have discovered since I made that video. But going back to what I did to start with and the data I still hold on that, Starmer himself has taken £12,500 from hedge fund Edgerton Capital co-founder John Armitage, the hedge fund currently managing some half a billion pounds of US private healthcare giant United Health Money, a company desperately trying to make inroads into UK healthcare, and who Starmer might just provide the keys to the kingdom to. Where Streeting again has taken money from John Armitage as well, just like Keir Starmer. But he's taken even more. He's taken 15,000 from him. And he's also taken another 7,500 from Trevor Chin, a long-time donor to right-wing Labour MPs that many of you may well have heard of. He's also decidedly pro-Israel and fond of funding Labour Friends of Israel members, again, such as Streeting. But from a private health perspective, though, Chin is a senior advisor to CVC Partners, which is a tech company which invests heavily in private health and pharmaceutical industries. Notably, one of the Starmer and Streeting alleged opponents in this civil war, Dr. Rosina Allen Khan, has taken two donations of, of £5,000 apiece from a chap called Chris Kilurhi, the most recent within the last year, who works in global health insurance. Perhaps she's not been bought off enough. But why take money from private health at all? And this is why I have my doubts over this civil war, because on one hand, Rosina Allen Khan is apparently opposing plans to bring in more private health provision, but on the other, she's taken donations from somewhere no Labour MP ought to have. And this has led me to look at other MPs apparently going to Warren Street against Starmer and having a butcher's at their claims of being against private health, and if they stand up versus any donations they might have taken. Now, this five out of six figure of MPs in health being against Labour health privatisation being driven by Starmer and Streeting comes about from the simple fact that Streeting has six junior ministers in his health team and only one of them is backing Streeting here. Blairite has been Liz Kendall, the shadow minister for social care. She who got just 4% of the vote when she ran against Jeremy Corbyn as the Blairite candidate. So you can kind of see why Starmer lied his weaselly black guts out about being a Blairite to become leader himself. She has zero entries in her most recent register of interest, which is fascinating in itself, but especially when you think, given her right-wing thinking, you'd think somebody would be tapping her for influence, but there's nothing in the register for the most recent one of it. Make of that what you will. As for the other five, well, I looked up Rosina Allen Can in the register myself. Can't wait for every Dr. Maps at the moment, it seems. The Shadow Minister for Mental Health, as she is, incidentally, though quite why an actual doctor isn't in charge of health rather than a careerist with no experience of the 
real world at all, like streeting, is a valid point, I think. But Alan can still does shifts to this day to keep her hand in at the local hospital, and fair play to her for that. And she's gone on record as saying private sector provision often lets people down, which is absolutely true. And ultimately, the dream of those who want to see the NHS collapse is to bring in an insurance-based healthcare system. So saying private healthcare is bad would carry more weight if you hadn't taken donations from health insurance interests or somebody with those interests. Those were the only such donations, however, I found in the most recent register for her. Though I did note a donation from an Erica Mitchell listed, which is the real name of E.L. James, the Fifty Shades author. So go figure as to whether that's good for your health or not. I couldn't possibly comment. Andrew Gwynn, the Shadow Minister for Public Health, Ferial Clark, the Shadow Minister for Primary Care and Public Safety, Karen Smith, the Shadow Spokesperson for Maternity Cover, and Ashley Dalton, who is street, Streeting's uh, PBS, have no private health connections that I've found. So in this case, perhaps my cynicism might just be unwarranted. Though Dalton is another without any listed interest whatsoever in the most recent register. Suspicion aside, she has only been an MP since this February, replacing Rosie Cooper. So give it time. I guess. At any rate, these five, aside from Alan Can's health insurance related donations, don't appear to have any hypocrisy in their ledgers that I've found to back up their opposition uh, or to, to, to counteract their opposition to private health care that is being championed by their bosses. So will they end up towing the line in the end is probably the next question, given how weak Labour have basically been in challenging Starmer and Co. Probably it's what we've become used to with Labour, isn't it? If they're determined to keep digging their heels in. They could well be names to watch out for in a potential reshuffle, which has been rumoured to be on the cards ahead of the next election amongst the Labour front benches. Where Labour should be making the case for removing privatisation in the NHS, they're trying to sell it instead as a solution, though, just as the Tories and New Labour did before. And is being worn away, eroded and softened up for US healthcare giants. The likes of Starmer and Streeting go on the telly, write bits in the Murdoch press or wherever and act like they have our interests at heart and urge us to trust them to fix the mess the Tories have made. But they won't fix it. They'll carry on doing exactly the same thing. We still see the NHS logo everywhere and we don't believe it is in any danger because of that reassuring sign. But sadly, the NHS logo is getting stuck on anything, whether it is the real deal or a private company now doing NHS work. The sign doesn't mean a thing anymore. And if you're one of the millions on a waiting list, it is cold comfort to you if you can still see the sign, but get no nearer to the help you actually need. Behind that logo, politicians hide their true intents. Behind the logo, the service continues to be chopped up and sold off piece by piece. But the signs stay up. They don't change. It all carries on like there is nothing to see here. A system that has been corrupted and toxified so it no longer works. And then the politicians will come along and say, well, we put more money in than ever before. When the reality is people need the service more than ever before and it's being underfunded as a result, despite their claims. When the reality is the politicians will say, despite having lasted for more than 70 years, the NHS is broken and cannot be fixed. When behind the logos, they're the ones who have been taking sledgehammers to it. We need staff that have been driven away back. We need attractive terms, conditions and training bursaries back and meaningful staff training brought in. We need the profitable parts of the NHS that have been stolen by private health interests to profiteer out of return to the NHS so they are making money for themselves again. And in addition to all of that not being done just because the nation needs a functional health service again, once the envy of the world, now being wrecked as we instead debate which colour of Tory, blue or red, we decide to vote in next to carry on destroying it further as both will do. It'll be gone for as long as we carry on electing fools, putting their own selfish dreams of personal enrichment first and foremost, and my confidence in Labour Party junior ministers and backbenchers, I'm afraid as long as it's evaporated. I might as well finish on a note of what the Green Party would do instead, because there are alternatives there, and Green Party health policy is extensive, there is a lot of it. And I'll go into them perhaps in more detail as we get into election campaigning. Of course, they're all listed on the Green Party website, as I repeatedly say in my videos. But first and foremost is the belief that healthcare is not a commodity. It is not to be bought and sold. The NHS exists to provide free healthcare at point of need, funded via the public purse as it should be, run by and accountable to local and national government, and devoid of all privatisation, be that in administration, healthcare provision, support services, or capital ownership. There can be no role in a service run for the benefit of all of us, for business interests who put lining shareholders' pockets first. That has to end. So there is an alternative to the two Tory parties on offer right now that will genuinely secure and save the NHS going forwards, repair the damage that's been done to it, get it back on its feet. And it doesn't require going to war with itself, as the Labour Party apparently is, to do that either. 
Thanks for watching. I hope you found the video useful. Please like, share and subscribe if you did. More content out daily. Do join in the conversation on this video by having your say in the comments below. Meanwhile, here's a video recommendation to keep with the channel a little bit longer. Where just last month, the NHS turned 75. Will it live to see many more birthdays the way things are going, though? And what are you prepared to do to save it? Will you, this time, keep it in mind when you go to vote? I'll hopefully catch you on the next bit. Cheers, folks.